thank you for joining us for identification of intimate partner violence in primary care. This is hosted by the Wonka Special Interest Group on Family Violence. As you are of, uh, probably aware, Wonka has a large number of um, member organizations worldwide, as you can see here on this map. And it also has a large number of working parties and special interest groups of which the special interest group on family violence is one of. Right, so we'll move on to our uh, learning objectives for today. Um, to understand how intimate partner violence survivors might present in primary care, to identify who to ask about intimate partner violence in primary care, to develop strategies for overcoming barriers to asking about intimate partner violence in primary care, and to develop skills in asking about intimate partner violence. I would like to acknowledge that it's very likely that there may well be, uh, there may well be amongst the participants here uh, survivors of family violence amongst us. I would like to acknowledge your strength and resilience. So I'll just tell you who I am. So I'm from Australia. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Monash University. I'm a doctor, family doctor, educator and researcher, and I'm the education lead for general practice at Monash. Um, I've been involved in the development of curriculum and teaching of family violence all over Australia. Um, and I am currently completing a PhD looking at the lived experience of general practitioners who are survivors of family violence. Of our three panellists, we have uh, Dr. Sajar Othman, uh, who is from Malaysia. Uh, Sajar is a professor of family medicine at the University Malaya Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She has a special interest in family violence, health behaviour and well-being. She chairs the Violence Intervention Committee of the University Malaya Medical Centre and co-chairs the World Organisation of Family Doctors Special Interest Group on Family Violence. We also have Dr. Abimbola Silva, a family physician from Nigeria. She's a family physician and chief medical director of Toprobane Medical Center, a secondary care private hospital in the capital of Nigeria, where we create a platform for holistic coordinated care for people of all age ranges and conditions with over 90% of their staff being women. They also incorporate wellness and a spa service as well as art therapy in their hospital practice. Her dissertation in 2011 was on intimate partner violence and its effects on women's health, with which she received an award for the best graduating fellow in the West African College of Physicians in Family Medicine for that year. Since then, she has been advocating for every woman in every way she can. She's happily married to Amal Silva, a Sri Lankan artist and has three daughters. And we also have with us Fatimang Ladola, who is a medical social worker from Malaysia. She's currently the head of department of medical social work at University Malaya Medical Center, Kuala Lumpur. She obtained her bachelor's degree in human development from University Putra, Malaysia. She then completed a master's degree in medical social work at University Kebanga Sun and she, uh, in Malaysia, and she has worked at UMMC for 27 years in various departments, including medicine, primary care, orthopedics, ONG, emergency, and pediatrics. And she has worked in medical social care for many years and has extensive knowledge of medical social care issues, particularly for women and children. She is passionate about improving the quality of social work in hospitals and advocating for the important role of medical social workers. Now, I want to just tell you what we're going to be doing in this session. I'm going to just share a few, five minutes of very quick, quick background for you. Uh, then we're going to get on to a 45 minute panel discussion uh, with our panelists, where we're going to explore those learning objectives that we spoke about earlier. And then we're going to have a really good amount of time, sort of 25 to 30 minutes of question and answer session for any burning questions that you may have for our panelists. <laughs> So I just um, really just wanted to go back to the basics. Um, some of you may, may be very much experts in this area already, but just uh, for, for those who aren't sure, intimate partner violence is defined as any behavior in an intimate relationship that causes physical, psychological, or sexual harm. It's very common. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that around one in three women worldwide are affected in their lifetime. 
Um, and of course, this differs from country to country. Um, in, uh, intimate partner violence, it, does, it tends very much to be gendered in nature. Um, it, 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 everywhere you go in the world, it affects women more than it affects men. It affects all countries, all socioeconomic groups, all cultural groups, and all religious groups. Now, our focus today is discussing intimate partner violence, but of course, there are a lot of other types of violence that do occur within the family. Uh, obviously, child abuse, the abuse of adolescents, the abuse of elders. Um, uh, so our focus is more on intimate partner violence, uh, but we you know, keep an open mind to the fact that there may be other forms of violence going on as well. Um, there are different types of violence that may occur. And the, you know, the obvious type of violence that most doctors think of when they think of family violence is to be thinking of physical violence. They think of injuries, bruising, lacerations, broken bones. Uh, but it, uh, there are certainly other forms of violence. And in fact, emotional psychological violence is probably, and coercive control are probably the most common forms of violence that we will see. Um, sexual and reproductive violence is, is also unfortunately very common. Um, we also see a lot of financial abuse happening as well. Um, and there's, you know, many examples of, of financial abuse. Uh, and these days, more and more, we're seeing technology abuse. Um, where, you know, tracking on phones and using, you know, trackers, putting trackers in people's cars, those sorts of things, um, you know, using people's mobile phones and computers and all those sorts of things. So uh, technology abuse is becoming more and more common as well. So why a primary care response? Why, why is it important? Um, and what we hope to show you is that this is a health issue. This is not just a social issue. Yes, there's an, absolutely there's a social aspect to it as well, but it is very much a health issue. And we, we will discuss that in the panel in just a moment. Um, and that, that's, um, you know, apart from friends and family members, survivors are actually more likely to present to a health professional um, and in Australia, we've got data that shows they're more likely to present to a GP than anyone else, including police and family violence workers. We know that it's a health issue for reasons that we'll discuss in a moment, but also family physicians have these long-term trusting relationships with their patients. So we're in a position where, you know, our patients do trust us and they, they would like us to ask about family violence. Uh, we know that from the literature um, that, that survivors would like to be asked about it. Um, we also look after the whole family. So we've got this big picture of what the family looks like. So this is why a primary care response is so important. And we'll talk a bit more about what we can actually do in primary care in a moment. It is common in primary care. Now, these are Australian data. Uh, but in Australia, a full-time family physician will see on average five current survivors of intimate partner violence per week. And somewhere between, depending on which, uh, da what data you look at, 8 to 28% of all female primary care patients have been survivors of intimate partner violence within the last 12 months. But only one in 10 uh, doctors, GPs, actually asks about intimate partner violence and only 12% of 12 of survivors has ever been asked about their family about um, family violence by their family physician. So it's unfortunately not very common. So that's just to give you a little bit of background, but now I'm, um, we're going to have our panelists discussion. So I'm going to exit the slides. And hopefully you've uh, been able to pin the panelists. Uh, for those who haven't, uh, who have just joined us, if you put your arrow over any of the panelists square, you will see three dots up the top of their square. If you press that, it, you will be able to see the option to pin the panelist. And that way they will be big on your screen. So that might just help you to be able to see the panelists a little bit more easily. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to direct this question towards Sajjar. Um, why do we need to identify intimate partner violence survivors in primary care? Thank you, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the first question. Um, I think it's very important 
uh, in terms of primary care services, it is located in the community and is very near to uh, the community members. And most often than not, we are the first point of contact um, for the health system. And we see our patients and also their family. So in primary care, it is very important that we, 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 we are able to identify early uh, in terms of intimate partner violence. Because once we identify early, we can help to prevent uh, the negative implications of partner violence. And because we know that the common um, the, co the the common projection is that it will become worse with time, so identifying early is important so that um, we will prevent the abuse from getting more worse with time. So that's that's one reason. And another reason is that once we are able to identify. Uh, who are affected by the partner violence, we can actually discuss uh, with the patients in terms of their safety. And also, we can also plan ahead how they can maintain their safety, regardless whether they decide to leave the relationship or if they want to leave the relationship. And another thing is, for those who are already involved, by identifying them, we can actually provide um, continuous support to them uh, because we know in intimate partner violence, uh, one of the nature is that they are isolated from their social network. So, so primary care uh, providers can uh, provide that kind of um, connection so that they are not isolated. Fantastic, thank you. Also, Jenny. Yeah, yeah, open bowler, thank you. If I may add, um, it's important to identify because sometimes some of these women don't even realize that they're actually being, you know, in an abusive relationship, you know, because for example, in Nigeria, there's a community, the Teve community, where wife beating is actually seen as a sign of love. And they they think that it's, you know, they don't even know they are actually in an abusive relationship. And the very first time that the primary caregiver asks about them, ask about it, that's the first time that they're they're realizing that, oh, maybe there's something actually wrong. So yeah. uh, asking about it is a, a way for them to actually start thinking about the kind of relationship that they're in, number one. Also because it's sometimes, especially in our environment, it's sometimes seen as a private family matter. I mean, why would I want to involve any stranger? But, so as a physician, we should be able to go out of our way to identify, to have a high index of sus suspicion and ask about it. And that may be the first time this person realizes that they're in a bad relationship. Now, as even though intimate partner violence is not a good experience to have, I think we should have a habit of learning to make it should we should make it normal talking about it even though people don't want to talk about it. i hope this this um event or this webinar will help us to start talking about it as physicians as yeah. well thank you uh, absolutely Sija? um I, I think the uh the good thing about primary care services is that we uh, can also uh, have efforts in preventing uh intimate partner violence from happening. Uh, one example is that we do have the maternal child health services. So we can identify early uh, in terms of uh, from the mothers and also when uh, our patients are coming, bringing their children, if they have some indicators. So it doesn't mean that it is just when it occurred that we identify them we can also identify them early on because we follow up our patients from, uh, you know, from womb to tomb. Yeah, absolutely. Fatimang, do you have any comments on this one? Yeah, I totally agree about identifying early. We should have this environment of giving people space uh, to share their problems early without needing to wait until 
serious injury or crisis. I think uh, we may be able to help them at early phase where they need to think, where we give them opportunity to think, to look at the relationship, the relationship that they're having, to seek clarification uh, rather than being paralyzed uh, later in terms of psychologically and emotionally. So we, we know that if we fail to identify IPV early, we may see the serious consequence and impact the abuse that goes to the Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, look, I've actually got something to add from my perspective as a clinician too. I actually feel that if you don't identify um, intimate partner violence where it's occurring, you actually are not able to properly um, really um, address a woman's needs and concerns. Um, you actually don't really find out what her needs and concerns are and you're not actually able as a clinician to help address them. And I, I think it's really important that, um, that we're able to do that for, for survivors of intimate partner violence. Um, so we do need to understand the situation. And also, uh, we, we, it may be that we also then, if we don't ask about it, if we don't identify it, we don't then understand um, the condition that the patient has come in with. For instance, if, they've been, if they're coming in with physical effects like somatic symptoms or something like that as a result of being um, abused, um, and you don't identify that violence is in fact occurring, you're not truly addressing this, the symptom that they've actually come in with. Um, so there's some of the things that I would also add to all the fantastic things that, that you've all said. Uh, and, and, you know, and agree with you all. I, I think that um, the, the safety aspect is really important here too, isn't it? Is you know, identifying it so that you can actually address the risk uh, and safety issues, I think, is, is also really key too. Um, we might move on to the next question. Um, Abby and Bola, how might a survivor present to their general practice clinic or their family medicine clinic? Yeah, thank you, Jenny. You know, just in continuation of what you actually started saying, you know, sometimes uh, a woman may just, you may just discover that there's a person, a patient coming continuously, frequently back and forth with vague symptoms, you know, because you haven't really addressed what the issue is. And that may be a, a way that they present, coming with vague, vague complaints, things that are not specific, back and forth. And that that may that may be an indicator that there might be something more that hasn't really been, been addressed. Then, of course, the um, usual common, most common one that you would see with physical injuries at different stages of healing with a very strange or illogical way in which the wound or the injury happened oh I hate the I I hate my face on the door those kind of you know so those are the commonest ones that you would see and then you you start such you know wondering oh this there's something going on and you should press for more and find out why this person has this kind of injuries fractures at different stages of healing and that the, the explanation for how the fracture occurred doesn't really add up then they may come with um and, and like you know, we've already talked about somatization symptoms and coming back and forth with strange or illogical or you know complaints symptoms that don't add up. Then um, they may come with generalized anxiety. They may be depressed. They may come with sleep disorders, mental health issues. They may be abusing drugs and abusing alcohol, or you know, especially you know the the mental aspect of it is is crucial, especially with the psychological kind of abuse when that's not that's so subtle in a relationship you know it's different it's not as easy as seeing a physical injury it's so subtle the psychological aspect may not it may not be easy to talk about so you should be on the lookout for people that have you know mental psychological problems or illnesses when they come to complain to you also a bit difficult is the sexual the sexual abuse in an intimate relationship you know 
especially in our, I mean, it's, it's, some women don't even know they're being raped by their husbands. And it's almost like a strange, why would you say your husband has raped you? So it's a, uh, it's, it's something that it's also, you would, um, should look out for, especially when the person is coming with recurrent sexually transmitted illnesses or recurrent upper respiratory tract, upper UTIs, urinary tract infections, um, you know, so it's, you should be a, you should have your high index of suspicion. So these are like clinical indicators that will help you to raise an alarm and then want to push a bit further to be able to ask and find out what is really going on. You know, people with chronic pain, people with, um, you know, a very protective, you know, partner when they're in the consulting room, the partner is extremely, there's nothing wrong with having a protective partner, but when there's, you know, it's extreme, the partner doesn't want the patient to leave his sight, and um, some of those things are red flags that you should look out for as a physician and then press forward further to ask more questions as what's going on. Absolutely. Before I ask the other panelists, I'll just uh, comment on one of one of our participants, Tony, has said also if we don't look and ask, we risk becoming part of the system and accept and ignore this violence. And I think that's a, a really great comment. Thanks for that, Tony. Um, have you got anything to add, Sajar? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think it would be very easy, or not to say easy, it would be less challenging to manage uh, intimate partner violence cases in primary care if they come with obvious injury, if they admit or they disclose uh, their experience to us. But it doesn't happen. Most of the time, even if they come with the injury, Sometimes, especially in uh, countries like in Malaysia where we wear, uh, you know, we wear the hijab or we wear the scarf, uh, it is hidden. So they may have physical injuries, but it is hidden. And if we are not careful, we may miss it. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, for them, uh, for, for the survivors to disclose and they want the doctors uh, to ask them first. So, so, uh, they, they may come with subtle presentation uh, and frequent presentation. So it, it's very important for us to have a high index of suspicion and start asking uh, these patients. Um, and then injuries is one thing. I think more often than not is the psychological or mental health aspect. Uh, and I think there are a lot of studies uh, you know, associating uh, mental health aspect to, uh, uh, you know, uh, their uh, experience of being abused. And also uh, in terms of somatization, the irritable bowel syndrome, uh, the chronic headache, you know, uh, the insomnia, these are very, very subtle. And also in terms of high-risk behaviors. And also if we have patients who are actually having problem uh, to uh, comply to their follow-up, especially uh, I think there are evidence to show that uh, antenatal mothers who book late or having issues to comply to their follow-up may be uh, some of the ways that uh, the survivors may present to primary care. Now, Raquel, one of our co-chairs co of the Special Interest Group on Family Violence who's here with us um, would like to make a comment. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer, um, and thank you all for being present today. Um, I just wanted to underline the, the words that you have mentioned, Sajar, the fact that psychological violence is always implicit in any kind of violence and abuse. And I um, I really wanted to, to highlight how you are addressing cultural and regional differences. I think this is also very important. Suspicion comes when we have training, so that is a must for us. So thank you for organizing this, uh, this event that I think is very necessary for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Fashion Mang, did you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, just a few. I think some of the signs are observable. It's just that whether we uh, decide to ignore, give attention to it. So through the patient's demeanor, attitude, and behavior, uh, probably we can we can see signs of fear, extreme 
compliance or non-compliance is uh, I just mentioned. Sense of helplessness. Uh, we can also observe uh, the people around our client patients. So if uh, they exhibit aggressiveness, we know that there's something wrong. Disrespectful, hostile, violence. So that uh, should give us red flags. Also, any visible effects for the children bleeds. We have to very give attention and be sensitive to these signs, even though before they even ask for help. So that's a way we should have a backup plan of probably pulling them to different areas and sort of. Thank you. We, we, all, we also have one of our other members of our steering committee of the Special Interest Group on Family Violence, Haggett, here. Um, Haggett, did you also want to make a comment? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to highlight that in primary care, uh, the non-compliance many times, uh, what we see is the uh, chronic conditions that are not controlled. We can see a lot of asthma attacks. We can see a high blood pressure, high sugar, uh, obesity that cannot be controlled or any other chronic disease that the patient has. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that we need to, to look for when yeah. we uh, see the, the compliance and so on. And also the OBGYN uh, implications. We can see a lot of issues of control around birth control, around sexual relationships. We can see unwanted pregnancies, abortions, as well as complications of uh, of pregnancy either to the mother or to the fetus. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think I think what you can all see here is the breadth of the indicators, the the breadth of the conditions and presentations. Uh, that a survivor of intimate partner violence may have. So from the psychological to the physical, to the psychosomatic, to the chronic disease, to the reproductive, uh, the you know, antenatal, postnatal um, issues in, the, in, in a baby, you know, all of these things, there are just so many different facets to this, along with, as Abimbola said, the you know, issues about overprotective partners and those sorts of presentations as well. I think what we want to make clear here too is um, that that they, we need to be looking out for these indicators so that we, we're aware of who it is that we should be asking. Um, and one thing I just also wanted to com comment on, an Australian study actually found that one in four women who present to their um, family physician with depression are currently survivors of, of intimate partner violence. So it makes, you know, one in four with depression. So, you know, it's very, very common when it comes, you know, particularly to the psychological, but also to all of these other things that we've mentioned as well. Um, anyone else in the panel want to make any final comments on this topic before we move on? Okay. Yeah, so I'm thinking whatever illness they have must be very difficult to heal to be careful if they are. Must, sorry, I didn't catch that. Can you say that again? Um, just adding that whatever illness that our survivors are having must be very difficult to recover from. Yeah, well, well, I, I mean, it must be very difficult for them. I mean, this is the effect of abuse. This is what abuse and violence does to someone. It actually makes them unwell. Um, it and it it cause it gives them health effects. Um, and. So, you know, it, it's really important that we recognize that and, and you know, and, and, that, and they suffer for it. Um, we, the, the next thing we're going to move on to, we're just going to actually move to looking at the dynamic of intimate partner violence. So we need to really now, you know, we, we can identify it, but we need to understand what it actually is about, what, what's actually happening um, in when intimate partner violence is occurring. And I wanted to ask Fatimung to make a comment on that. Okay, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, in a normal, healthy and nurturing relationship, uh, 
power and control dynamics are balanced and mutual, typically balanced and mutual. So this will say mutual respect and we're not afraid to express ourselves. We support each other. We we can have arguments, but we resolve conflict through dialogue company, rather than through violence, right? Um, but in IPV, we don't see this happening. So uh, there are abusive characteristic that used by one partner to gain and maintain power and control in the relationship. So some central elements in IPV, as we know, like eating, using physical force to actually to have easy win over the partner, right? So especially when you are physically weak, so there's no chance that you can win or whatever things in the relationship. So they use emotional abuse, manipulating emotions through insult, threats, humiliation, degrading, to undermine the partner and self-esteem and independence. So I've seen a survivor was asked to stand naked in the veranda. That really kills the esteem climate. We have a partner isolating their partners from the support, limiting their access to money because uh, they, they, they think they have the power once the partner or the survivor, the victim, uh, is lack of all these resources. Intimidation to create an atmosphere that is uh, fearful and can be controlled. Blame, blaming victim, causing the abuse also. Also, we can see that they use the children to control the children. Mm. Yeah. Ab ab sorry, did you have anything else to say, Fatima? I think that's it. I just saw yeah. some... No, no yeah, look, you know, absolutely. It is about power and control, isn't it? And and I'm just wondering whether Sajar or Abimbola wants to also comment on that at all. Well, um, it's important to really understand the dynamics, especially when we're talking about providing help or safety because it's so crucial that we see that it's not just um, about one bad person and a good person or anything like that. The crucial aspect of the control, we must pay attention to that when we're trying to help the person that is being controlled. First of all, they may not even, like we said, see that they're un under this deep control of this other person. And the person that is controlling the perpetrator is also, also protective over their control. So it's it's important for us as primary care you know givers as we're trying to help with that control to um to 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 understand this and then the cycle that continues you know once even if we try to help the person the fact that they have this strong belief that this person that they love so much you know and that's the dilemma we, there's love in this relationship or at least you know the, you know that you care about one person and then it's extending to something that harms you. So it's a very, very delicate um, situation that helping this survivor, you need to understand that delicate, the delicate nature of the relationship for us to be able to truly, completely, properly help them. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Sija? Uh, three things I want to add here in terms of the dynamic uh, of uh, IPV. Uh, I think the first one is rightly like what Fatimang and Abimbola mentioned uh, is the power and control of one uh, partner over the other uh, in balance of uh, authority and also uh, acceptance of uh, aggression uh, in that relationship uh, as one of the ways to uh, resolve the conflict. 
And I also want to bring up here uh, in terms of the cycle of violence that happening in uh, IPV relationship uh, is the cycle. So you can start with you know, tension building, it can uh, tension building and then explosion. Then there's a remorse. So so the cycle goes you know round and round. So much so that uh, survivors of IPV can become very very confused. On one hand, you have someone who loved them, love her, but at the same time, it also can be someone who can actually immediately change personality and become very abusive. Mm. And uh, that's uh, in short in terms of cycle of violence. So. I think understanding the cycle of violence uh, is important so that we as a healthcare provider uh, can understand why it is very challenging for some of the survivors or most of the survivors to break out from that relationship. And then the third thing is about uh, the, the tight spring concept. Just now, uh, in, in the very beginning, I mentioned about the projection of uh, the relationship in uh, if there is intimate partner violence. So what happened is that uh, in the beginning of relationship when there is abuse going on, so they will seek help from uh, their close one or perhaps from their formal resources like you know healthcare providers is one of them. But if they decide to go back to their their uh, partner, then then when they go to seek help uh, at another time. Uh, then uh, she may get less support uh, from her resources. And then same thing in terms of the cycle of violence. The initial cycle may take one year, maybe the abuse occur uh, once a year, but it gets you know shorter, the cycle. So it becomes uh, more frequent. And then plus with the uh, getting less and less uh, support from uh, you know from the resources then it make it even more harder uh, for for the survivors uh, to go through the relationship and then sorry one last one I think it's very very important for us to uh, be aware and remember uh, the close connection between intimate partner violence and child abuse uh, in fact, uh, I think up to 60% of, uh, of a family where there is intimate partner violence, there's also child abuse uh, going on at the same family. So when you, once you identify one, don't forget the other, the other types yeah. of abuse. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, and Tony actually made a comment about that in the chat as well. And I think that that's actually very, very true. We're going to have to move on. Um, this is a fairly short question. So I might just direct it to you, Sija. Uh, which patients should be asked about intimate partner violence in primary care? Definitely those patients with indicators. Uh, remember, we mentioned about uh, physical injuries. Okay. Um, and then uh, also, there are indicators in terms of psychological indicators like uh, what we mentioned just now, anxiety, depression, maybe insomnia, and also patients with uh, emotional uh, e emotional uh, issues and also behavioural, those who does not come uh, or comply to their follow-up. So having said that, um, so we ask people who have the indicators. It used to be that uh, there are recommendations to screen everyone in primary care for intimate partner violence. But I think the later evidence says that uh, there is not enough support for that uh, to do universal screening for everyone. But there is strong recommendation uh, uh, for uh, us to ask uh, antenatal mothers uh, regarding partner violence. Mm. That's, that's in short. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So basically all the things that we were talking about before in terms of those indicators, those ways that a survivor might present, they're, they're, they're all the people that we should be asking, uh, as well as, of course, antenatal women as well. Yeah. Um, all right. This is, this is to all of you. Um, how do you ask a potential survivor? Who would like to start with that one? Abin Bola, would you like to um. <laughs> Yeah, um, how? First of all, we should be sure that, you know, it's a, the place, the setting is, there's a lot of privacy. Like we said, not everybody wants to talk about this. So you must create a conducive environment for the person to actually talk. So that it should be, you know, 
private setting, then you must be able to reassure the person about safety. And before you reassure about safety, you better be sure that you can actually offer this safety. So um, you should be able to reassure the person that you're not going to go back and confirm from the perpetrator, for example, you know, that so the environment is private, this, the setting is, you know, calm and conducive for, you know, talk, for talking, and then you reassure them of safety, you reassure that, you know, you're not going to go back and ask about it. And then you should ask direct mm. questions. You know, you should, you don't know beating about the bush. Once we have said, you know, like we said, once you have identified that this person has clinical risk factor or clinical indicators, then you should actually directly ask the questions about, you know, about violence. Make sure that, you know, they understand your question so that it's easy for them to be able to answer properly. And also remember to be culturally, sens culturally sensitive when you're asking those questions, depending on where you're practicing. Um, you know, make sure that it's it, you know they under they understand the question. It's culturally sensitive. It's direct. It's in a private place, and the environment is conducive for them to actually answer it properly. Yeah. Right. Um. So, how about the actual asking? How might you go about that, Sajar, in primary mm -hmm. care? I think two ways to do it. Uh, I think first is, um, especially if you have patient who is not that obvious in terms of presentation, the you know, patient who keep coming back and you're wondering what's going on with this patient, everything is out of control. Sometimes we can start with a general question first, asking, for example, how are things at home? Mm -hmm. And then from then on, you, you funnel it towards specific question. But there are also uh, situations where patient comes with uh, injuries and you suspect that uh, it is uh, due to someone uh, doing that to the patient. Then we ask directly to say that, oh, to, uh, to ask the, the person uh, regarding, uh, maybe we, we can say that, you know, this kind of injury it seems that somebody has hit you. And then we go from there. Mm. And also uh, another technique is that uh, we can say uh, we can say that uh, you know violence is very common in uh, the community, and because of that, I ask uh, nearly all my patients or my patients on this uh, about violence. So and it start to start the co uh, conversation going. So that's some of the ways to do it. Mm. And uh, there are also research tools. Uh, uh, where I, I think in some places what they do is that uh, if the patient register through the computer, uh, there are questions that the patient can answer beforehand to actually identify if there are potential survivors of IPV. So when would they do those tools? Would they do them like when they before they come in to see the doctor or? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, Fashima, um, so sorry. No, no, go on, Abimbola. Yes, I, I was going to say that some of those tools are also short, very short, that as a physician, um, since we said we don't do universal, I mean, it's not recommended to do the universal screening. Once you, the physician, recognizes that this, this person has clinical indicators and you want to ask, some of those tools are very short. You can actually, you know, learn them and they have short mnemonics. So as a physician, you can actually administer them quickly and, you know, score them on the spot because the questions are quick, they're easy. Like, for example, there's a hits, hits tool that talks about, did he hit you? Did he insult you? Did he threaten you? Did he scream at you? Just those four questions. And you can actually quickly get the answer and then be able to record it and identify quickly just in a few, in a few minutes of the consultation while you start, you know, in a conversational manner. Yeah, not doing it like uh, it's it, it, like Saja has said. You started asking about the family, or you're asking them. These are general questions I ask my, you know. So it's just add it to your conversation. Yeah. At the back of your mind, you know what you're doing, and then but because you've been trained, and then you can actually pick it up from just from asking. And I tool. agree with you. I've I've trained many hundreds of um family physicians in the area of family violence, and I generally find that they like the idea of a conversational approach to asking rather than necessarily having a tick box approach, um because it, it sort of falls more naturally into the way that we you know our communication skills and things that we use as family physicians, doesn't it? So I can, but I I like the idea of being able to incorporate a tool, but actually being able 
able to incorporate in a way that you can use it conversationally. That that sounds like a fantastic idea. I was just going to add, uh, ask Fatimang whether you had anything to add to this at all. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I think question, but we should be able to relate to the answers and uh, deeper conversations. Sometimes uh, we don't ask questions, but we can offer supportive statements. For uh, example, uh, um, I'm here to help you. If uh, there's any issues involving injustice or has anyone been uh, you badly sort of thing and with uh, Dr. Abimbola mentioned the correct setting, normally you will push the right button. Mm. Yes, Saja. Um, I'm just reflecting. I've, I've been doing on IPV for more than 20 years and you know, uh, the first patient that I identified, uh, it took her around three years to be able to open up to me. Mm. Okay, uh, this is a patient whom I follow up for hypertension and mm. diabetes. It took her three years mm. uh, to open up to me. And I did a mistake that uh, at that time, the moment I identified that she has been abused, I uh, referred her to a psychiatrist who also at that time in 1990s not trained in IPV so she yeah. was labeled with a psychiatric diagnosis yeah. and she came back to me and say uh, Dr. Saja if you are going to send me to see a psychiatrist again I will not see you again mm -hmm. so so the point is uh, with this story is that one uh, I think we have to have uh, a high index of suspicion and we have to have the intention to, to help the patient. Uh, trust should be there. And after that, when I started to uh, do a lot more work in this area, um, I find that I cannot attract a lot of, not that I attract, I think they are there. It's just that once you get trained, it's easier for your patients to, to feel that you're ready to help and yeah. want to help. And I suppose uh, asking the correct question uh, I think comes easily, not to say it's, it's not that easy to ask this kind of question, but it's better uh, now than before. Mm -hmm. so, so one is to have the intention, high index of suspicion, and then give the impression that we are there to help. Because I know that uh, some of the survivors mentioned to me um, through my previous research, uh, uh, the, some of the survivors will say that okay, uh, the, this doctor is very, very, uh, is very kind. I feel like telling uh, my 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 abuse uh, history, but the problem is uh, she seems so busy. Mm. I don't think this is the correct time to open up uh, mm. uh, uh, the, the story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you you remind me of the the fact that. Um, so we know that survivors actually in general want to be asked by their family physician about abuse and violence. Um, we also know that uh, they would like a family physician who's going to be non-judgmental, who's going to listen and who's gonna, is going to believe their story. Um, and I think these are all really important factors about when you're asking is that you, you are going to believe their story, you are going to listen to them, uh, and you are going to listen non-judgmentally to their story. And I think that they're all really important factors. Um, and yes, yeah, so but I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Sajar, it's really important. Um, so we, we're just going to um, very, very quickly mention, so before we talk about barriers, we're just going to mention um, the response. Now, this this um, we don't have time today to be completely focused on response, but we but just for those who aren't aware of it, this is what the World Health Organization recommend. Once someone has disclosed to you um, that they are a survivor of intimate partner violence, um, the World Health Organization recommends the lives approach, which is to listen. Um, which is a little bit about what I was talking about, to inquire about what their current needs and concerns are. And that's the, you know, that's the survivor's needs and concerns, not what you as the doctor think is their needs and concerns, um, to validate them, which is to say what is happening to you is not your fault. Um, you know, everyone deserves to be safe. 
it is not okay what is happening to you. It may well be the first time that anyone has ever said that they're not to blame for what is actually happening to them. To enhance their safety, that which would take a whole other webinar in itself to explain, but basically to do a risk assessment and safety planning with the patient. And then to organise supports, which uh, may well uh, uh, be a referral to family violence services, uh, but definitely ongoing follow up with you as the family physician, because you have a relationship with this patient and that's obviously important. And it may well be to offer particular phone, uh, phone numbers, supportive phone numbers as well. Um, so I'm just going to move on then to our next question, which is what are the barriers to family physicians asking about intimate partner violence? And the second part of the question is how can we overcome those barriers? Who would like to start? Okay, um, I could start. Let me just start by saying that sometimes, well, like Saja has said now, it took three years for some of for one, one you know, person to disclose. Um, so it's sometimes it may just be the timing. It may, the timing may just not be right for the physician, for the for the victim. So the timing may just not be right or not enough in that consultation. And, you know, the person just appears so busy and doesn't have time. So they may not be able to, um, you know, get the victim to disclose. Also, the stigma of, of course, talking about it. I mean, well-educated, well-earning, I mean, well positioned woman coming to talk about or whatever it is it's not nice to be able to admit that in that situation so that stigma also um is a barrier for G gp being able to you know ask about it the gp themselves may not even want to really talk about it because they may not be prepared about with what happens next you know if the gp hasn't prepared you know you've not prepared yourself for what you can do to help they don't know how you can help so if the GP, you know, family physician is not prepared, for example, you know, what we normally would do is when we discover something, we refer to neuro neurosurgeon, refer to gynecologist, but we have to have our plans of, you know, knowing where to refer to. And that is part of our preparation. So if the family physician hasn't prepared themselves, then it's difficult for you to ask about what, you know, ask about it since you don't want to open the Pandora box. You don't know what you're going to do right after asking, you know. So then the fear of what the perpetrator would do, of course, to you as a family yeah. physician, yeah. you know, you have to consider your safety as well. Yeah. Maybe a very, you know, very, this is, we're talking about control and balance and control and power. And this is someone who has been under the control of this perpetrator. And you, this family physician, this stranger, you want to take her out of my control? then the perpetrator may also, you may be a target as well. So you, there must be some kind of way of ensuring that, that I mean, that fear is part of why some family physicians also don't really want to talk about it. And then, you know, it's been said that majority of the harm or even suicide or homicide, sorry, that happens to survivors occurs around the time they want to leave around the time they are finally, their eyes are finally opened and they want to do something about their situation. They want to escape their perpetrator or even they have just escaped, you know? So that period of trying to help could be the time, the most vulnerable time for that survivor, mm. uh, you know, to for her life as far as um, the perpetrator is concerned. So all of these fears that, you know, the, from the doctor, from the, those, from the, that um victim those are the reasons why sometimes nobody wants to open or start the trouble you know yeah. and then of course the denial of oh how can this person who loves me so much actually really be doing something bad you know so for this for the survivor they just can't seem to understand but are you sure this is really bad so that denial also is a problem for the gp even if you try to help and you can see clearly that this person is under that kind of in an abusive relationship so yeah. um I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's there's barriers for the family physician and there's also barriers for the survivor, isn't there? I mean, yeah, and that fear of the perpetrator, yeah. but that's for both the survivor and also for the family physician as well, isn't it? And it's a very legitimate concern. Absolutely. Fadimang or Saja, would either of you like to make a comment? I, I just want to add in terms of uh, the provider's challenge, um, 
because doctors are also part of the community members and we may also resonate the same cultural values. Um, it used to be we have a lot of uh, evidence that doctors do not want to ask because they think that this is a private matter. But of late, because of the awareness, uh, they understand that it's not a private matter. IPV is a crime because we do have legislation on that. And they start asking. So their role is not just uh, in terms of medical, uh, medical role, but also uh, in terms of, um, you know, collecting uh, information that will help the patient in case the patient wants to go into the uh, legislation or intervention using the, the law. But having said that, uh, I don't know uh, in other parts of the world, but in, in Malaysia, uh, doctors are so, I think, frightened so medical legal cases, so much so that, you know, they're very, very cautious. And then if they can get somebody else to see the patient, then they will do that. Mm. Uh, in our system, we have the one-stop crisis center model which is located at the emergency uh, department of the hospital mm -hmm. so, uh, but i think that's fine you can refer them but i think our role still you still need to support the patient and not become paralyzed because you're afraid that you know you may be involved in a medical legal cases so that's one uh, another thing is in terms of the uh, the environment, the setup itself, um, especially the public uh, facilities. Uh, the patient load is a lot. So time is uh, a huge challenge. And another thing is uh, the setup. Uh, some of the consultation room, uh, it is shared. So that mm. does not allow any, you know, that, that is very difficult to talk about uh, about sensitive things in yeah. that consultation room. And uh, also, uh, uh, in, in Malaysia, we are about to have, uh, you know, a standardized guideline how to uh, manage IPV patients uh, is coming. But before this, we only rely the model from the One Stop Crisis Center, which may not be that relatable because it is hospital based and ours is primary care based. So that's in short and some of the barriers um, yeah. that I can think about. Yeah. Fasha Mang, do you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, not much. It's just that uh, that uh, emphasize the importance of having uh, teamwork, especially in handling medical legal crisis cases like this. So as for the uh, survivors, uh, Different survivors may have different barriers. So it's uh, important for us to understand. For example, if some choose not to disclose, yeah, as uh, uh, I mean, someone in the audience say it's important to leave the door open. We respect the decisions. Probably they have issues with distrust. That is where we have to improve our rapport and trust. Probably maybe if they have a reason not to disclose because of they feel afraid, that's where we need to ensure the safety and those things. It's always we can always customize our strategy in handling each and different case. Saja, did you want to add? Uh, I, I think one crucial thing is about uh, training on IPV or yeah, mm -hmm. interpersonal violence. Uh, I mean, considering the prevalence of IPV is very high, I think higher than diabetes in some places. Uh, and you'd be surprised that there is no training for uh, undergraduates on this uh, on this uh, on this topic. So, uh, so I think uh, it is very very important to have um, training for primary care doctors. Uh, undergraduate or maybe once they have graduated so that uh, they are more aware of the situation and they can provide uh, effective ways uh, to intervene and uh, proper support for the patients involved in abuse. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I would say in all the training that I do, um, 
the, the most common thing that people would say is a barrier to them asking is that they don't know what to do next. They don't want to ask because if someone discloses, they don't actually know what to do about it. Um, and so I, I totally agree with you. I think training is absolutely vital, but it needs to come with system change as well. Like it needs to go hand in hand, I think too, doesn't it? So, yeah. Um, and Haggett has just said that there should be more organisational support, such as social workers on site and, of course, training. Uh, in my university, I do undergraduate as well as postgraduate, but it's not uh, so in many places. And it, it's so variable, isn't it? So, some places get training, some places get none. We've got medical schools in Australia that don't do any. We've got medical schools that do a lot. It's you know, varies enormously. Evan Bolly, you wanted to make a comment? Yes, I wanted to add that even if there's you know, training, which is necessary and many places is not available, you know, you must still be able to find out what is available regarding help in your vicinity. Mm, you know, the training generally will tell you about, you know, what to do, what to look at for. But then regarding where are the safe homes, who do you yeah. refer to for yeah. this particular, because it's a multi, you know, it's it's a, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach to actual proper care, you know, so where do you find the social workers, where do you find the safe houses, where do you, when do you refer to the police, where do you call the lawyer, you know, so for your environment yeah. where you're practicing, apart from learning the training of what to do, as a family physician, the onus is on us to also find out where those locations are so you know where to, what, where to refer them to when you need to. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely need local knowledge, don't you? It's so important. I really agree with that. And that kind of really, you know, segues us into the final question, really, which is the role of the GP in supporting survivors. Um, and you've mentioned that already, the knowledge of the, the services is obviously a really important factor there. And, you know, I've already mentioned follow-up and our own support of the survivors. Are there any other facets to our, our role in supporting survivors? I think especially in where resources in uh, the health facilities in primary care is short, um, then it's very important uh, for the GPs to be able to link up to the specialised services. Uh, so meaning if you don't have the facilities, then identifying them and then getting uh, the survivors to get help from a specialized services. But if you are located in an organization that is big, then uh, I think you can still link it within the internal uh, system. Right. Uh, and also uh, importantly is that uh, continuing follow up for the survivors because it's not just about you know the impact of violence on them health physical or mental health but there's a lot more in terms of how can they cope with parenting and also in terms of their children because their children may be also be affected so as i think as a primary care physician a family doctor so you look at it as a whole not just at that incident only yeah. And you've got a good point, always considering the children. So when you're asking, if there, if there are children in the household, you're not just asking um, the, your patient, um, you're asking about the children at the same time too, aren't you? And considering the whole family and yeah, absolutely. Um, Fatimang, did you wanna make a comment at all? I know that you're not a family physician, uh, but in terms of uh, the role of primary care, I guess, in supporting survivors. Yeah. Uh, since you support survivor and you support towards the community, so I think it's vice versa support each other. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just um wonder it about uh, because we have experts in the community where normally they form uh, themselves as NGOs. Mm -hmm. Locators. So uh, I can say that they're the experts in this. They know how to handle the situation. They are survivors, they are educators. So I think it's good that if we can link our services. To who, who would like to comment next? Abimbola, would you like to comment? 
about the role well, of GP? The only, I saw something. Well, the role of GP is just like we said before. It's the the onus is on us to find out the things that you know are available. So you are it's like you're arming yourself with mm -hmm. that knowledge to be able to be an effective family physician. You know the the same way you you you're helping with the delivery of the baby, helping with the you know care of the child. Care the, you know you know we are all rounders as you know as mm -hmm. as family physicians. This must you know be included in part of what we we do and until we train ourselves about the local avail available you know local things so that you know how to help then we not have the confidence to ask and ask properly and and continue to support like you know in, in part of that um slide you shared is a is a plan you create a plan for safety create a plan for continuous support and until you we, we are trained and we go out of our way to learn what to do to keep them safe keep them you know um supported then we may not have been able to, we, we may not be able to give all we should as family physicians as a whole. Did uh, Sajal, you had your hand up earlier. Did you have anything else to add? Yeah, uh, I was about to say in terms of advocacy, so yeah. primary care doctors can be agents of change in the community. Yeah. We are located in the community. Perhaps a simple uh, poster to say that IPV is wrong. You know, just creating awareness so that people start talking about that. But then I saw uh, Hagit's uh, comment yeah. that GPs uh, can see the perpetrator as well. Uh, is is not as easy. I agree that uh, GPs should be able to also offer support for perpetrators um, because they also have got their health implication. Uh, they may also have got mental health issue such as anxiety, depression, or they may also have got past history of being abused, all right, uh, to get them to be uh, in this, uh, you know, state. Uh, but uh, that is uh, another big intervention uh, worth discussing I, I think in another discussion uh, session. Well, I'd like to thank our panellists. Uh, we're going to invite any questions from any of you now or any discussion points that you'd like to make. So if you want to just pop any questions in the chat that you have for our panellists, we'd really appreciate that. Um, anything that sort of that this is raised or any sort of thing, you know, thoughts that you've got about the topic or anything like that. Um, do you know, I actually think we, we, don't, we don't have a huge number. So what I might even do is I might actually make it so that you can unmute yourselves. Uh, just give me a minute. So, um, so raise your hand if you've got a question. Uh, or a comment, because it doesn't have to be a question. You could also be making a comment uh, and, and you can unmute yourself and make your comment if you like. Jenny, I saw uh, familiar names uh, like uh, Shoba. Shoba, uh, I work with Shoba, Shoba uh, with the NGO, uh, WAO. Uh, and I learned a lot when I first started. I learned from Shoba. Uh, perhaps if she has any comment. And also it would be great if people could uh, turn on their cameras as well so we can see you all now. That would be fantastic. Okay, while we're waiting for questions, if I may just also jump in on the perpetrator thing that Hagi talked about and Sajai responded to. I mean, I would think if if you were going to help the perpetrators, it probably shouldn't be the same family physician that's caring for the wife or for the, you know, otherwise that automatically <laughs> means that you have, you know, re, you, that you have given away confidentiality if you are then going to address the husband as a perpetrator. Okay, so um, someone wants to talk. Yeah, young Lee Tan. Yeah, hi. Thanks so much for the really great presentation. My question is directed to uh, Prof. Saja and Wan Fatima. So just a bit of background. I'm Hyang Lee and I'm from Malaysia. And I used to work at Women's Aid Organization, one of the NGOs that supports survivors of domestic violence. So um, 
I'm I'm really curious to learn uh what you think about what can be done to strengthen the primary care response to intimate partner violence in Malaysia. That's my first question. Um, and second question, um, it's really great to hear that there has been um, developments on creating some guidelines for intimate partner violence. I'm curious whether the guidelines are specific for the primary care system or is it broader for the you know, overall health system? Thanks so much. Thank you for the question. Um, the first question, how to strengthen primary care uh, services in terms of IPV intervention. I, I, I think we need to create awareness and also to, to get the policy uh, maker to understand that, hey, there's primary care. There's a lot of ways in the community because uh, at least uh, in Malaysia, uh, we are uh, if we follow the model, the one-stop crisis model, which is good, but it is only the hospital base. And the previous guideline in 2015 uh, mentioned all the agencies, including the NGOs, but they uh, they fail to see there's primary care uh, uh, providers uh, in the guideline, and there is no link. So, firstly, is uh, to get the policymaker uh, to understand that there's primary care services that uh, the doctors and also the privates can also uh, play a role in IPV. Secondly, is uh, at least in Malaysia, it's about the top down. So once it is being um, you know recognized, then uh, there will be more activities that will uh, you know um, go down to the ground on the, to the ground. And then just to let you know that. Uh, I'm involved with uh, the making of the um, the newer guideline, uh, although it is still uh, for the uh, one stop crisis center, the hospital base. But we managed to create a link uh, for primary primary care providers uh, in terms of uh, interpersonal violence. So hopefully, uh, I think it will be launched very soon. Uh, hopefully, with this guideline. Uh, one thing is that it will inform uh, the primary care providers uh, of what to do at primary care settings and how to link it up to other agencies. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question from Caroline Johnson. How well does the legal system in different countries, sorry, I'll just get it back again. How well does the legal system in different countries support survivors who decide to take action against violent partners? In Australia, in the event of separation, often both parents have access to the children and the violence continues. This is a big barrier to survivors taking action. And I can completely agree with that because I'm in Australia and I see that too. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so uh, we're interested though in other experiences in other countries. Um, does any, any of the panel have any comments or anyone else who's here with us today um, who's got experience working in this area? I don't well, have much. In Nigeria. Sorry. Go on. Go on, I, I don't have much experience in terms of the legal intervention, but uh, what I know is that uh, we do have uh, the Domestic Violence Act that protect uh, uh, protect the survivors and from the perpetrator. Uh, that's all I know. And also, there is a newer. Uh, they call it emergency protection order. Uh, that was introduced uh, during the pandemic that provide immediate protection order uh, for the survivors. But in terms of access to the children, I'm, I'm not so uh, well versed about this. Uh, perhaps I can get help from maybe Fatima? Uh, yeah. Uh, normally when it involves children, uh, which we have more cases involving child abuse uh, being reported, that is where normally we track uh, to the domestic violence happens in the family. So in uh, child abuse uh, cases, uh, we try to be fair for parents because 
both has uh, the same uh, how how do we say it? Uh, uh, they, they they can have access if they are not abuser to the children. So we understand that. That's why normally when we see such cases, we need to be objective. We need to focus on the uh, adult if it involves them, it involves the adult uh, uh, only. So then after that, if they uh, decide to contest the custody, uh, they should bring it to, either, to the but I think uh, we have a dilemma because if it's not proven that uh, children are, are being abused by the, uh, the partner, so it's not fair to stop them from seeing the children. I think that's the general concept because uh, we don't mix survivor issues with uh, the children issues. Abimbola, what's the Nigerian experience? Uh, okay, um, in Nigeria, we have what we call a uh, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. It's a very robust act that describes kind of different uh, um, violence that is available. The major problem we have is with implementation. Even though the um we have an agency that is involved with uh, that is supposed to you know how do you could, um carry out or enforce enforce that act um well it's not a universal it's not it's not generally available per se you need to know who is where and that's also part of why the doctor also needs to know how to connect with them to be able to get the kind of um justice for the for the survivor and what has also have what also happens of course is that most and we have ngos who take up you know the supports of you know the survivors so as a physician you should know which ngo will be able to help you support the survivor for you to be able to address or at least refer them appropriately so but the laws are there so it's the implementation that's usually just the um the problem you know in some situations i know in some countries you are mandated to report some of these things but in nigeria you may not if you don't report sometimes you know the person may not get you know their their justice and like the question says for those who want to press charges is usually i can say it's all the kind of success that has you know happened at all is through NGOs, not the government or the you know you know the the laws that have been set set in place the laws are there mm -hmm. it's just the enforcement that's a bit you know that needs help in most places, but NGOs have been, you know, filling the gap and trying to help. Thank you. Um, there's some great comments about uh, dating violence and the importance of recognizing that as, you know, as intimate partner violence. And um, I think that's something obviously in, in primary care, we need to be really aware of that. Um, so then uh, Haggett's got a question. Following on from Caroline's questions about the legal system um, is about religious, religious, religious leaders, which have a lot of influence in the community. How well do they support talking about intimate partner violence and promoting interventions? Um, I, I suspect this would vary enormously country to country. So I'd be interested to know from, from anyone here what their experiences are. I think our religious leaders are um, getting more involved in terms of creating awareness uh, for intimate partner violence and also to bring out the paradigm of patriarchal and also men defending the women and then highlighting more towards that in a relationship uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, you are supposed to, you know, uh, not abuse your partner. So, so the discussion, I, I think the discussion used to be like, you can marry for 
<laughs> okay, that will be you can marry for because you're Muslim. Now it becomes to more like okay, so you've got a wife, so it is your responsibility uh, to take care of the well-being uh, of your spouse. So that is one example, and also uh, there are also active uh, active uh, strategies taken. Uh, some of the mosques actually offered uh, a place as a as a shelter. Uh, for the survivors, so that that is a a good move uh, by the religious body. But having said that, uh, there are still a lot more to be done because it it is a bit mixed up with the cultural values, which is very very flawed uh, in terms of the role of we uh, the role of men and women in a relationship. Anyone else want to make a comment? Well, maybe just to you know continue what Sajjah was saying about the mix up of religion and culture. That's mm. really deep. So that mixture is part of why there's still a bit of lag in um if it's like if women are ac accepted as the property of the man, um it's you tend to hear those kind of things even from the religious um from the you know Nigeria is a mix of Muslim and Christian, you know, almost in equal quantity in proportions, I would say. So, but but both religions, nobody's no religion actively supports harming the other person, but because of the culture blend and you know the the patriarchy is still very strong, and at the end of the day, is it's almost not correct for a woman to complain about whatever it is her husband has done to her so um um so that's strong but like like Shaja also said yes there's some some ray of hope where the religious leaders are beginning to see that you know the fact that the, the partner is abusive you know you don't necessarily need to continue to encourage them to stay in the relationship you know in Christianity there's also the issue of oh divorce is a sin and um, you know, leaving your partner is a crime. You know, in the eye of the, the in the eye of God. So those those things are also that as barriers for um in in helping women who are in abusive relationships. But it's coming up. People, the Pentecostal and the Elite pastors are beginning to see that these things are not setting. There there are other scriptures that support the fact that the woman can actually leave her husband if he's not good for her and um, move on to some other life that is better for her so religion the blend of culture makes it a bit difficult but there's hope mm. Mm. no that's very interesting it, it may also be different pockets in different places and different um subgroups and things like that too because i certainly know in my neck of the woods in melbourne australia growing up there was a very strong religious community, Christian religious community that very much encouraged coercive control. Um, and um, so, you know, that's that that was my experience in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and, you know, but but there are many religious groups in Melbourne, Australia who wouldn't um, encourage um, anything like that. So I think it, it can vary from from group to group. So let, let's hope that most groups are not like that. So yeah. There's a different level of religion. Uh, and definitely we need uh, religious leaders to play a role because what we uh, we do is that uh, this this uh, understanding uh, of uh, we cannot be disobedient to our partner so what we, we call mushus but in fact in the religion there are other clause that protects uh, women, for example, if you are abused, then it's different clause already. But uh, I think I'm not very sure why the obedient part is overemphasized. So, yeah. Um, any other comments or questions? Anything else anyone wants to add? We're just about to wrap up. Well, thanks. Thank if, if there's not any other comments, um, thanks for a really fantastic discussion. I'd really like to thank our panellists. 
Um, Abin Bola, Fatimang, Sajjar, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to everyone else who's been with us. I hope you got something out of the discussion. Um, and we really look forward to seeing you hopefully at further webinars that we're going to be holding on other topics in the future. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and yeah, have a good evening, morning, lunchtime, night, wherever you are. <laughs>